Before we begin the video, please subscribe and hit the button bell for you to get notified when we have new exciting videos to watch. Hello. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Um, last year, I made a $1,000 bet with my younger cousin. Uh, normally, when siblings make bets, it's over something fun like, you know, doing a backflip on a motorcycle or something crazy like that. But mine was purely artistic. So the bet was I had to get 1,000 likes on ArtStation within six months for something that I'm terrible at, which is 2D painting and drawing. And to make things more interesting, if I actually succeeded, I would actually get nothing. So the deal was if I failed, I would give him $1,000. And uh, if, I, if I succeeded, I'd get nothing. So why would I do that, right? Why put myself through that? Um, basically, I've always wanted to learn painting, but somehow the motivation was never there. And then I learned about loss aversion, which is that you're much more motivated to stick with something when you have something to lose. Um, and it worked. So for the next six months, uh, almost every single day, I was drawing, painting, going to drawing classes on weekends, all sorts of things, um, learning to draw. And I'm pleased to say that with just three days left in the challenge, um, I disappointed my cousin by reaching the thousand likes on ArtStation. Um, now, I don't say this to impress anyone, of course. Um, I say it because while I learned a lot about drawing and painting, I learned a lot more about how to be an effective artist. Because previous to this, uh, the way I learned Blender was the way most people learn new things, which is, you know, they learn it when they have time, they, you know, drift around, they watch tutorials, wherever. But when you have something to lose, like $1,000, it really throws things into questions, uh, into question. So what I've done is I've distilled down the seven biggest lessons, the seven biggest habits um, into, yeah, into this presentation. Uh, and throughout it, I'll also talk about, uh, yeah, the habits that some of the world-class professionals today use. So you'll learn what, for example, uh, Stephen King, Pixar, and even Kanye West have in common. <clears throat> so, guys interested? Yeah. All right, good, yay. Okay, so first habit is, uh, yeah, deceptively simple, daily work. You need to be working on your task, your, your artwork, whatever creative goal you have, every single day. Now, when you think of this, you think, why every single day? Why can't I just do it when I have time? Like, if I worked one hour Monday to Friday, by the weekend, that's just five hours. Why can't I just do five hours on, on Saturday or Sunday, right? Well, the thing is, is that we, these large blocks of time that we imagine, they very rarely ever pan out. Um, and this is why most great artists across history achieve whatever it is that they do, writing books, writing music, whatever it is, by putting in time every single day. So for example, J.K. Rowling wrote uh, The World of Hogwarts, Harry Potter, um, across five years. And uh, she did that whilst raising a child. And instead of waiting for these big grand moments where she'd have free time on uh, you know, a weekend far away where she could block it off with the child and a babysitter. She worked on it any spare chance she had uh, every single day. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld wrote the Seinfeld series by putting an X on the calendar for every single day that he wrote jokes. And then after he had a couple of days in a row, his next goal was to just not break that chain. Uh, Mike Babiglia, another comedian and a screenwriter, uh, found that he was putting off writing his movie script um, because, uh, because he had too many meetings with other people. So instead what he did, he did something interesting, which was to make himself a meeting with his script every day at the cafe, to sit down for two hours at a laptop and type away. And he found by doing that, he wouldn't put it off. And personally, from a personal experience, um, yeah, I could speak on daily work in that it's like, it sounds simple, like who wouldn't want to work every single day, right? Like it's, everybody would want to do that. Why doesn't people, why don't people do it? And the thing is, is that after you've worked a whole day at the office, listening to your boss ramble about stuff, you come home, you're tired. Last thing you want to do is punish yourself by learning something new. Instead, you end up on Netflix, Reddit, 
video games, whatever it is, right? So one thing that I found worked for me was to uh, agree to do the smallest amount of work possible. So in my case, it was to put the pencil on a paper and draw one line. So on days when I felt like, oh, I can't do anything, I don't want to do anything. I've had such a tough day, I just want to sit and relax. I'd say, all right, well, can I do one line? So I go, all right, I can do one line. So the thing is, is by the time you clear the table, get the notebook out, you get all your pencils ready, you get the sharpener, you get the eraser, you get the chair, the lighting, you sit down. By the time you do all that, of course you don't stop at one, one line. Before you know it, you've done a couple of hours and you've just lost track of time. So that getting started is often the hardest part about it. Once you can do that, it's, uh, it's fine. So that's what worked for me. Obviously it's a much bigger topic, motivation. There's a bunch of books on it um, if you're interested. Daily work, it always trumps. Uh, short sprints. The word Trump looks funny now, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like, it's, it's changed its meaning. <laughs> Number two, volume, not perfection. Right, now, honestly speaking, who here would consider themselves a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to their artwork? Show of hands. Most people, right? Most artists have this affliction, and a lot of artists would actually consider it one of their strengths to be a perfectionist. Um, now, why you should be striving for a high standard of excellence and for bettering the work that you did last, being a perfectionist actually undermines your growth because it prevents you from reaching the next epiphany, the, the next lesson. So Ira Glass um, from the famous This American Life uh, radio show said it best by saying that the most important thing you can do is a lot of work. It's only by going through a volume of work that you're going to close the gap. Or to give a more uh, well-known example, think of Picasso, okay? Most people can really only pinpoint sort of a handful of his works and go like, yeah, that's Picasso, right? We know that. Uh, but actually, his library of work includes 1,800 paintings, 1,200 sculptures, 2,800 ceramics, and 12,000 drawings, and this isn't including prints, rugs, or tapestries. So Picasso has a huge volume of work, and most of us can really only pinpoint the, the hits the big ones that really went on to success. So he has this huge volume of work. And if you're wondering if the volume of work had anything to do with the success, um, researchers say that it did. So they did a study on 15,000 musical compositions from Beethoven, Mozart, things like that. And they found that the, the more compositions that a composer produced in a five year period, the greater spike in the odds that they actually created a hit. So. Volume is very important. Um, so from a, speaking from a personal standpoint, um, I found that when I was creating these, uh, these 2D works, that the perfectionism stage, that last little bit where you've done most of the work, but you know, tweaking it, zooming in really closely, and uh, you know, getting the fine details and the shadows and the lighting and all that kind of stuff, it eats up a lot of time. And the interesting thing is, is that it, you don't actually learn a lot in that last bit. The majority of the learning comes in the stuff before it, where you're putting down the big shapes, the, uh, you know, getting the anatomy of the face, all that stuff, right? That's the stuff that takes, uh, that, that, that you learn the most from. The, the stuff at the end, that's easy. It's putting reference next to the thing, zooming in closely and just painting over it. And that's the stuff that eats up a lot of time. So my point is, is that if you're a perfectionist, um, you're not able to, to get to the next lesson, to get to the next big um, epiphany. So, volume, not perfection. Get on with your next work. That's number two. Number three, steel. Right. So, um, it's common to, uh, to look at the work of our idols and just assume that they, you know, they were born to do whatever it is they do. That Rembrandt, just first time he started painting, he was, uh, he was just had this idea for how to paint light and shadow. Well, the Quentin Tarantino just was born to make these fun, interesting stories, right? Um, but that's not how the human brain works. It's always built upon the ideas before it. So our idols, the stuff that we look at and go like, they, they're such an original, how did they do this thing? They built upon stuff, their idols, stuff that they loved. And this is why if you look across history, you'll find that most great artists recommend stealing. So David Bowie says, the only art I'll ever study is stuff that I can steal from. Uh, Steve Jobs openly admitted in an interview that they're shameless about stealing their great ideas. And 
you've got Banksy stealing the stealing quote from Pablo Picasso. <laughs> Love that one. So if you're curious, like, well, why are all these people suggesting stealing? Stealing is immoral. That's what we grew up with. That's, that's, that's wrong. Well, there's a, there's a difference between good theft and bad theft. And this is outlined in the book, Steal Like an Artist. Um, and uh, really, the, the, there's a whole, yeah, there's a list there. But the one that really stands out to me, the most important one, is third from the top. Stealing from many versus stealing from one person. You steal from one person, that's called plagiarism. You steal from many, people can't tell. Or, as Gary Painter put it best, if you have one person you're influenced by, everyone will say that you're the next whoever. But if you rip off a hundred people, everyone will say, you're so original. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so one thing I would recommend um, is, uh, is, is find your idols. Find things that you truly love right now. And this is very easy to do with the internet uh, world today. Um, you can just go on ArtStation and find stuff you love. So this is what I did. Um, at the start of my challenge, I started an Evernote file and I just went through ArtStation and I just copy pasted the stuff that I loved and put it into one file. Um, you don't have to be like, don't overthink it, don't over discriminate. I didn't even quote the artist. I don't know who some of these people even are. I just copied and pasted it. And this worked as both reference and inspiration in the future. So when I was making a face and I didn't know, you know, something wasn't right about the eyes, I just opened this up, went to all these different ones. And I'm like, oh, that's how they did that. That's how they did that. And then on days, like really dark days when I really weren't, wasn't motivated to work, this also works as inspiration because opening it up reminds you of why you got started. Stuff that you love truly, not thinking about traditional painters or anything like that. Stuff that you truly love. So uh, yeah, that's steal. Find your idols and steal from them. Number four. Conscious learning. So show of hands, um, who has heard that practice makes perfect? Most people. And all the other one, of course, is, uh, you know, if you want to get good at something, you want to master something, you need 10,000 hours of practice, right? Well, I used to think this was the case, and this was the advice that I give to people in my podcasts or my tutorials. I say, someone emails and says, I want to get good at Blender. I say, you got to practice. Practice, 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 practice. Um, but the thing is, is that um, this isn't really, that's, that's not all it is because the human brain is wired to avoid pain. So practice can actually, if you're not careful about it, it can become a source of procrastination. So we tend to think of practice like this, like the more time I put in, the greater the results will be and it'll be a linear graph. But really, it sort of becomes a little bit like this. You get a little bit of growth at the start, but after that you can sort of stagnate with just pure practice. So, um, and I actually, um, before I started my challenge, I had the chance to, um, I, I just emailed some people that I liked and I was like, hey, can I ask you a couple of questions about painting? And uh, one of them was the artist Eflam Mercier, which I love his work, incredible. And uh, he said something I'd never heard of before, which was that one of the biggest wastes of time is not being conscious of what you're doing, or in other words, doodling around. And uh, it didn't really occur to me until later on what he actually meant. So one thing I like to do um, by myself when I'm working at home, just on the computer, it's very lonely work, what I do. Um, I don't talk with a lot of people. And so at the end of the day, sometimes what I like to do is I just like to hear people talk. So I put on my headphones and I listen to podcasts. Bill Burr or you know your mom's house podcast, a lot of comedian talk. And it's just, it's relaxing to me. So what I do is I'd open up a notepad, I'd put on the earbuds and I'd listen to podcasts and I would just sketch. Not really a goal in mind, but I would just sketch. And um, what I was doing was not good. It was really quite horrible, actually. Um, not, some of them don't even look like people. But I thought, you know, the age old mantra, practice makes perfect. If I just keep at it, I'll get better. But I looked through the previous work, I flipped through the pages and I noticed that from a couple of weeks ago, they weren't really, there wasn't any difference between them. Like I wasn't getting better over time. They were sort of about the same. And I thought, well, I'm putting in more and more hours here, but I'm not learning. So I thought, oh, okay, well, I've got to go back and I've got to learn something. Believe it or not, I actually hate watching some tutorials. <laughs> <laughs> Some tutorials, especially drawing theory videos, can be incredibly dry stuff. Uh, my wife took this photo of me when I was um, 
uh, watching a facial anatomy course. One of the most boring courses I ever sat through. But I did this and I hated it. Like, end of the day, I don't want to challenge myself. And I'm sure you, you can relate to it after you've done a hard day. If you're going to sit down with Blender, sometimes you just want to do what you know, right? And I hated doing this stuff. But in this, this process, I learned, I discovered that I completely misremembered several facial measurements. So I was drawing faces that were totally wrong and they never would have gotten better unless I'd learned this. So after I completed this, my faces improved almost immediately, just like that because I stopped to relearn. Had I continued just practicing, practice makes perfect, it wouldn't have gotten better. So really, this graph looks a bit better like this. When you include conscious learning in it, you, you, you go up a step. Your, your, your areas really improve at greater, greater amounts than if you were just doing practice alone. So practice is important, don't get me wrong, but practice alone makes perfect, I don't agree with. It's conscious learning. It's not always fun, but it's the fastest way to grow. Rest. <laughs> so uh, who has had, had an experience where maybe you're working on a scene in Blender and then um, you're just stuck. You hit a brick wall, you don't really know what's going on and you're just stressed out. Who's had that experience before? You're just like, ah, oh, yeah, lots. Okay, that's good to see. <laughs> Not alone there. I have this a lot and you've probably had this experience as well that maybe you walk away and you start doing the dishes and then suddenly you come up with the solution. It's weird, maybe you're in the shower, you use something and you just go like, oh yeah, I could use, put the lighting on the other side, I could change the color of the shirt, that would match the thing. You know, and you just think of this thing when you're removed from the work. So this is actually a strategy that most professional artists use. So for example, Stephen King, he reckons, uh, what would he know? No, Stephen King, he says that any novel, regardless of its size, shouldn't take longer than three months to complete the first draft. But then after the three months, you should stop work and not look at it for six weeks. Six weeks, do something else, go on a holiday or start another book, do something else. Then after that, when you come back to it, it's like you're reading somebody else's work. You see it from a completely different perspective, one that you would never go, never have gotten had you just sat there and just continued to type away. Uh, oh, I'm supposed to skip that. Anyways, um, and uh, from a personal experience, um, I found like I drew this uh, Ray from Star Wars over a couple of nights, and I didn't really know where to go with it. And I was like, oh, you know, black and white, sort of traditional, got a black background, whatever. I didn't really know where to go from there. Um, so I took a two day, uh, three day break. I went and just, I started some other drawings and did some other stuff. And then after three days, I came back to it. And I remember feeling completely detached from it in a good way, in that I could basically uh, just, yeah, work on it like like I, I wasn't um, like I, I, <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't in it anymore. Like I could I could uh, experiment with it. So I remember like seeing a brush that I'd never seen before in Photoshop, and I just drew over the top of it, and I was like, ooh, that looks kind of interesting. And then within about 15 minutes, I had this. Uh, this, this interesting effect, like this sort of like force, kind of like weird sort of awe about it. And I never would have gotten there had I continued to work beyond those two days. So that break, that rest period gave me a period where I felt, yeah, detached from it. So having this rest period is, is very important. Um, it's also actually now what we do at Blunder Guru um, as a strategy. So if we're working, if we've got three artworks we want to create for like a trailer, like Grass Essentials trailer or something, instead of doing all three of them, like we complete one to completion, then start the next one, and then the next one to completion, start the next one. We do all three of them simultaneously. So we work on this one for one day, this one for the next day, and this one for the next day, then loop back. And every time you loop back to it and you repeat the cycle and go through them one by one again, you see things that you never would have seen before. And I'm sure you can all relate to this feeling anyway. So that's rest. Take a break, take a break, and see your work with fresh eyes. All right, number six is feedback. So we sort of imagine when we think of like original thinkers, great artists across history, that they were, you know, they, they were original. So they had to thumb their nose to the critics and the naysayers and people that said, oh, that's not good, you shouldn't do that. And they had to just do because they knew what they were doing was the right thing. Um, but if you actually look at professional artists and you listen to interviews or biographies, you'll find that the exact opposite is true. They seek feedback more than anyone. Um, and that's the one thing I found true, like looking across musicians, writers, anything like that, they all seek incredible amounts of feedback. 
Um, so for example, Pixar, they have a room, uh, I believe it's called the, the Brain Trust, which is that when you walk in the room, your role is removed and you are free to speak your mind. So you could be a junior artist day one and you could sit down and you could say, this movie sucks. You know, just like sitting next to you could be the CEO of Disney, you know, and you both have equal say in it and you're not going to get fired, you're not going to get any repercussions. It's a free process to speak your mind. And this, Ed Catmull, the co-founder of Pixar, says is one of the most crucial parts to their, their success. Um, because their early movies suck. And he, he went on to great lengths to remind people how bad the first versions of their movies are. He said they are not these great masterpieces that they just come out from day one and just make it. It's through a process of iteration and feedback. They change the movie to be totally different from what it started with. That's the, that's the only way that it gets there. Um, and in terms of people uh, seeking feedback, the one person you'd imagine that would be least inclined maybe to seek feedback will be maybe this guy, right? Guy that's sort of sure of where he's going, right? Kanye West. Um, if you look at his most popular, most um, celebrated album, uh, My Dark Beautiful Twisted Fantasy, uh, this album that was like unanimously loved by critics, some people said it's the best hip hop album uh, of the last decade, or decades of our generation. Um, just unanimously loved by all critics. This was the work of several artists. I actually had a look, there was 38 artists and producers that contributed to the album. So he actually rented a, um, a studio in Hawaii and then flew in his favorite artists. So people like Jay-Z, Rihanna, Drake, um, a bunch of people to come and both contribute to the album but also critique it. So Pusha T mentioned in an interview the, uh, the process for it which is that he would basically take people in a room and say, what do you think of this? And he was sincerely interested in what they had to say. Um, and when you compare this with Pixar, it sounds a very similar process. No one's gonna be persecuted, it's, it's true, honest feedback, and that is what, um, that's what can contribute to the success. Um, to give a 3D example, this is a sort of 3D conference. Um, Noman School, right, who knows Noman? You guys heard of Noman? Yeah, great stuff. They are the, actually the number one uh, CG school in the world. I think they have a 97% placement rate. And I think the second school underneath that is like 50%. Like crazy, they're doing some amazing stuff there. Um, and they actually came to Australia, uh, to Melbourne, and they had like a weekend event, and I went there. Um, and yeah, I was talking with um, Alex Alvarez, who's the founder, and um, he was saying that although all students there have a high standard of excellence, they, uh, in, in every classroom, there's about one or two people that, go, that are the rock stars, that will go on to huge amounts of success and have no problem finding work in the future. And so I asked him, I said, well, what separates the rock stars from all the other students? And without missing a beat, he said, they seek criticism and then they actually listen to it. He didn't mention composition, lighting, storytelling, any of that stuff. It was the sole thing that actually, that separates the rock stars from the, the rest of the pack. Very interesting. Um, and from a personal standpoint, I can vouch and say that, um, yeah, I had this work here, wasn't happy with it. I posted it on Twitter, and I got a bit of feedback, but I wasn't really, eh, I wasn't really sure, you know, where to go with it. And uh, it was actually at the Noman event that uh, there was Dylan Eckert there, who's a character artist from Disney. And I came up to him, and I'm like, hey, can I show you some work, you know? bust my balls, tell me what you think of it. And he said, sure, I took out my iPhone and straight away he pointed out, he goes, you got two different sources of lighting, looks very odd, backlit and frontlit, doesn't match. And also you got two different styles. You've got a cartoony style face and then you've got some realistic hair, you have to match them up. Like, interesting. Straight away, I knew exactly what he meant and it only took like a minute, but it saved me hours of work. So my future works, um, I worked on this and it improved a lot. All right, I'd hope to, I'd hope to say it improved a bit. So that's get feedback. It's worth its weight in gold. Number seven is to create what you love. So I personally think that motivation is a hugely overlooked area of art. Like we tend to imagine that the great artists, you could give them any topic and they could make it great. Like that's what we, we sort of imagine. But really, if you look at the work that the great artists and musicians of today are making, it's stuff that they are personally interested in. So, Christopher Nolan, that's his name, right? Christopher Nolan? Yeah? <laughs> Christopher Nolan, I don't know why I had a memory blank. Uh, 
He makes movies about things that he's really interested in, about the state of mind and being trapped and things and like sci-fi sort of elements. He's really interested in this stuff. And he builds these stories and these worlds that have a, a, a depth that you often don't find and that, that are sort of missing from you know, some, some similar movies, right? Elon Musk, he's not an artist, but somewhat successful. Um, his three companies, SpaceX, Tesla, Solar City. Uh, he created these companies because he has an interest in humanity and seeing it succeed. So this is that's just like a personal intrinsic motivation. Uh, and it's stuff that he's interested in. I'm sure if he started a company on, I don't know, if he started a bakery, I'm sure it would suck. Because like, he's, he's not a genius. He, like, well, he's a genius, but he, <laughs> but, uh, he, he can't like, the mid-ass touch, that, that mid thing, I, I think it's really, it's stuff that, uh, it's themes that that particular artist is interested in. Um, to give a more artistic example, Brian Eno, who's a great artist, makes this ambient music. Um, he said he got into it because he was interested in listening to music that he wanted to hear. And that really shows um, through his music. Uh, and from a personal, uh, personal story, um, I remember when I was doing some drawings, I was posting them up on Twitter and Facebook and you know, these little sketches and things. And uh, pretty soon, after a couple of months, people said, oh, so you're only gonna draw cute girls? <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's, it, like, it affected me. I'm like, oh no, I'm gonna become one of those guys that just, just draws cute girls. I'm like, ah, oh, and, like, and this was like family members telling me, people online, people on Instagram, they're like, oh, well, you just draw girls, you know? And uh, so I was like, oh, I gotta balance it out. I gotta start drawing some dudes, <laughs> right? So I started drawing some guys, and I, I, it just didn't work. My heart wasn't in it, right? Hector Salamanca, I love the series, but I just wasn't interested in it. And the effort required to make something look good, like you need that intrinsic motivation. So my heart just wasn't in it. And I remember there was, um, so this was at around the time that Mythbusters was hitting their decade of being on air or something like that. And uh, I don't really watch Mythbusters. I know it's a cool show and you know, science, all that stuff. But um, I, yeah, I wasn't really interested, but I thought, you know, other people would like it if I probably drew a nice picture of, you know, the two guys on it. <laughs> Didn't really work. And uh, yeah, again, my heart wasn't in it. It's a great show, but I just, I just don't watch it, you know? So, you know, after a while of having these failed attempts, I was like eating time. I've got, you know, six months to achieve this thing and I was wasting time. And then I had this epiphany, like, like, who gives a shit what people think, <laughs> right? Like, who cares? And so I went back and I started doing the stuff that I really loved, which was, like, honestly, I find girls to be a lot more of an attractive subject than most guys, right? That's just what I think. And look, there's enough red tape in life, like the government telling you what you can do, your boss telling you what you can work on. Art is one of the few fields where you get to do what you truly are interested in. And so I personally think that when you start letting other people interfere and tell you what you should and shouldn't do, I think it's a big mistake. So create what you love. You'll make better work, honestly you will, and you'll stay motivated in the, in the long run. So that's the summary. Daily work, put in work every single day, focus on, uh, on habit building, very important. Don't be a perfectionist, although you think it's a good thing, it's generally not. Find your, uh, your idols, steal from them. Um, and uh, conscious learning, although it kind of sucks, you do need to go through and find what your weaknesses are and attack them. Have a break, that's often better than just working through it. Um, get feedback from every, everybody. It's not a good thing to be putting your head in your sand and going through it. And then finally, create what you love. Thank you. Please subscribe and hit the button bell.